Hi, it's Sam Singer again. Not far from my place in Habitsville, there's a piano bar. It's literally called The Piano Bar. One of those places with the ironically obvious name. I'd never been there before. I know yet another place in my own hometown that I've never visited. I don't get out much. I had heard about the piano bar from our new intern at the Habitsville Gazette, Luke. Luke's a young, goofy kid in his second year of college, and if I had to guess, I wouldn't say he was particularly socially skilled, or especially popular. He wore those really large, square, wireframe glasses that made him look far too intellectual, even though, in reality, he wasn't at all. So I immediately thought it was odd that he frequented a high-end piano bar in downtown Habitsville. The music that drifted out of it was always either classical or jazz, and the people I saw entering and leaving were always dressed up. But still, Luke continually vouched for the place, saying that it had even become a nightly routine of his to finish up his work at the paper, then head down to the piano bar. And at first, I didn't think too much about his newfound passion. But then, I noticed the holes in his mouth. I hadn't seen them initially. I believe this was because it was the back molar that went missing first. But after a few days, the gaps began creeping in towards the center. Until I couldn't not see them. So even though it seemed sort of rude, and I didn't know Luke all that well, I decided to ask. Luke, and I had started, as we were about to leave for the night. Do you mind if I ask you a odd question? He smiled at me, and that bright smile of the young and delusioned, minus a few teeth. Yeah, go ahead, he answered. I tried to keep my gaze from drifting to the peaks of thrashing tongue I could see through the dark spaces in his gums, and instead strove to maintain eye contact. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> what, um, what happened to your teeth? To my great surprise... He didn't seem offended, or even taken aback by my sudden inquiry. Instead, his broken grin only widened. I told you, I've been going to the piano bar every night. I waited for more details to come, but none did. And that took your teeth? He laughed, a wet, soft sound. I know it sounds weird, but trust me, it's worth it. And then he said something, something that for the life of me, I couldn't wrap my head around. If you give the piano man a tooth, you'll play your memory. I opened my mouth to ask a follow-up question, but Luke's bag was already on his shoulder. I really got to get going, he said hurriedly. You've kind of got to go there early if you wanted to play you a song or else, you know, he finished. But of course, I did not. No. Luke seemed really anxious to leave, so I bid him a good night. We both left, heading in opposite directions, he to the piano bar and me to my home. To sit and stew over what I had just been told. And then, the next day, Luke didn't show up to work. We thought that he might have been ill, and like the kid he is, forgotten to call and let us know that he wouldn't be coming in that day. But then the next day came. And still, there's no Luke. We sent someone over to his apartment to knock on the door, but there was no answer. I knew it was quite a leap in logic to make, but the investigative reporter inside me couldn't seem to shake the idea that the piano bar had something to do with Luke's disappearance. So that's why on Thursday night I found myself severely underdressed and seated on a stool in the darkest corner of the mysterious piano bar. There were all sorts in the crowd that night, people I had never seen on the streets or in the shops around Habitsville. I wondered if they had come from out of town just to come here. But the main sight was in the very center of the room. It was a huge piano, grand in every sense of the word. Although the bar itself was dimly lit and a tad smoky, every ounce of light in the place was reflected against the jet black sheen of the great instrument. On top of the piano, in an odd sort of display, were an assortment of objects. There was an elaborate hairpin with 
metal bumblebee on the end, a few assorted rings, a pair of gloves. But there was one item in particular that caught my eye because they were so familiar. Large, square, wire-framed glasses. I could hear bits and pieces of ambient music coming from the keys, stroked by the fingers of one of the most striking human beings I'd ever seen. The Piano Man. His hair was absolutely sculpted. His suit was dark green velvet with a silky black bow tie. His hands moved steadily across the keys, but his eyes weren't watching them. Instead, his irises, nearly the same green as his suit, wandered over the chattering crowd. A content smile on his closed lips. I jumped as a loud bell tolled throughout the room, but no one else seemed to share my reaction. Immediately, all the patrons fell silent, and there was a great shift as each of them turned their attention and their bodies toward the piano man. Like planets orbiting some bright sun. He had stopped playing, the final notes echoing in the air as he pulled his hands back and gracefully stood up from his bench. He took a moment in the silence to gaze over the crowd, turning a full circle around the room. There was a moment when I felt as though his eyes met mine, and a shiver ran down my spine. Then suddenly he reached out his arm and pointed. The woman at the end of his finger immediately turned red and uneasily gestured to herself. Me? I heard her say. Yes, of course, you, the piano man answered, in a voice smooth as silk and warm as summer. The woman clasped her hands together, the look on her face that of pure joy. She stepped forward, separating herself from the rest of the crowd. The piano man stared at her for a moment, before sitting back down on his bench. There was a breath, a second of ringing silence, and then... Then he played the most beautiful music I'd ever heard in my life. Now, I'm not a big music person. I don't know composers besides the basics, and even less actual pieces. I'm more of a podcast guy, to be sure. But there was something about this that was different. It was hypnotic, almost. There was no way to tell how long the actual song was, because from the moment it began to the second that it ended, it was as though I was suspended in a trance of joyful derealization. But eventually the last note was played. My eyes refocused, and I saw, although the song had quite an impact on myself, it was even more transformative to the woman the piano man had chosen. She was sobbing, large tears rolling down her cheeks, her shoulders shaking with emotion. When the piano man stood up again, she immediately wrapped her arms around him, although although it was muffled, I could hear her say, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over, as the crowd began to applaud enthusiastically. The piano man waited a moment, then gently pushed the woman back. The applause died down. The piano man looked the woman in the eyes, and then he grinned. And I could see, even from the corner where I was sitting, that he was missing teeth. There were three open spaces in his mouth, two on the bottom, one on the left of his very front tooth. He smiled at the woman, who was still racked with the emotions the performance had brought on. And then he spoke. Time for your payment. There was a flash of something like fear on the woman's face, but then she nodded, and she did something incredibly strange, something that I did not expect at all. She opened her mouth. The piano man raised his hand, the same one that he had played the keys so beautifully and elegantly. He slowly brought it forward until the majority of it was in the woman's mouth. I could hear her breathing, fast and wheezy with the obstruction. Her eyes watered even more than they had before, and she let out a few high-pitched squeaks of pain. The piano man's arm began to vibrate with effort. The woman's face turned a violent shade of red, and then... Crack! The piano man's hand reemerged, and I could see it between his fingertips. Pink with blood, but shining all the same, was one 
large tooth pulled out to the root. A line of blood dripped from the woman's open mouth as she brought a comforting hand to the side of her jaw. She stepped backwards to her spot in the crowd. A few patted her on the shoulder, but most of their attention still turned to the man in the green suit in the center of the room. He stared at the tooth and held it aloft to the light as though admiring a pearl he had pulled from a clam. And then he did something that's so odd. I doubted I'd even seen it correctly. He threw it directly up in the air, like tossing a coin, and as it fell down, he opened his jaw wide and caught it in his mouth. Then, with one heavy, wet sound, he swallowed it. But he wasn't done. He brought one of his hands to his face, the thumb and pointer finger pressing into a crescent. He stuck his fingers into his mouth, breathed hard, and then exhaled. There was a high-pitched whistle, and then an audible snap resonated in the room. The piano man paused. And then he smiled for his audience, and I could see that... I could see that which was impossible. One of the spaces in his bottom teeth had filled in, as though nothing had ever been missing to begin with. It was incredible. Uh, of course, it was incredible. He he did it one more time that night, nearly the same start to finish, only it was a man the second time. The melody he played was a bit different, sadder somehow, but still absolutely riveting. He pulled the tooth, he swallowed it, he whistled. In the other spot in his bottom row, now filled in. And then, as the room watched in silence, he walked away from the piano and out the front door of the bar. In a few minutes, the patrons, too, left the piano bar. They milled about on the street outside, chatting and smoking. There was no sound of the piano man, so I tried to glean some information from the conversations of the various groups. It's amazing, isn't it? The woman who was chosen for the first song was saying. I saw her. I mean, I, I really saw her. I saw my mother. Yeah, it's truly incredible. The man she was speaking to replied. Pity about the tooth, though. I must have been standing a little too close to them, because soon he seemed to notice that I was lurking nearby. Hey, can we help you? He asked with an unsubtle glance at my lackluster wardrobe. Yeah, I was just wondering. I mean, I wanted to know. It's hard when your questions are so big to put them into confines of words. What was that in there? The woman raised her eyebrows. Have you never been to the piano bar, dear? She asked, then winced, placing her hand back on her cheek, which was starting to swell. I shook my head. Oh, well, what a treat for you. She attempted to smile, then dropped it once she felt the pain. It's really quite simple. The piano man takes a single tooth from you, and in exchange, he'll let you relive a memory you've forgotten. I shook my head. What do you mean a memory you've forgotten? The man gave an impatient huff. Well, exactly as it sounds, boy. Be patient with him, Rupert, the woman scolded. She looked back towards me kindly. To be honest, no one's quite sure how he does it. But if the piano man chooses you, he's able to play you a song that will help you remember something you don't know you've forgotten. Something you don't know is important. Her voice grew soft and misty, and her eyes glimmered. I saw an afternoon with my mother when I was four. We had tomato sandwiches by the lake. She braided my hair. I was too young to remember, but now... Now my mother's gone. And I want every piece of her I can get. I tried to understand what she was saying. But... But your tooth... She shook her head, once again, fighting a smile back down. For the chance to have a bit more time with someone you've lost? What would you not be willing to give up for something like that? I nodded, though the entire thing was difficult to believe, but there had to have been something about that music, something in the air, and the fact that people were so willing to pay in pain for each performance. Thank you. I think... Uh, I think I'll come back tomorrow night. There was a falter in the woman's expression. 
Oh, I... The man put his hand on her shoulder and she stopped speaking. You do that, son. Come on, Bonnie. We gotta be getting home. The woman, Bonnie, looked at me for another moment as though she wanted to say something. Then she turned and the two of them walked back down the street. Despite the odd feeling that Bonnie had given me, I did come back the next night. I sat in the same seat, a stool near the back, and the rest of the piano bar was almost identical to what it had been the first night, except for a few things. For one, the crowd was much smaller. It was thinned out considerably since the previous performance, and those that were here had an odd atmosphere to them. It seemed nervous, almost. A certain apprehension that hadn't been seen there before. Secondly, the piano man himself wasn't playing idling little melodies in the center of the room. Instead, he was playing with gusto, at full volume. There was an energy to him that evening, an eagerness, and it was coming out in some of the most elaborate piano playing I had ever seen. Still, his eyes didn't watch his hands, and instead scanned the room. I could see the one remaining gap in his teeth, black and hollow through the thin sneer of his lips. There was a man sitting next to me that night, and like me, he didn't seem like he belonged there. He wore a collared shirt and wore khakis, and I got the impression that those were probably the nicest clothes he had. Something he wore to church on Sundays. But despite this, he was wearing a faded blue baseball cap that was ripped around the brim, nearly falling apart. He was in his late forties, then his face was lined far more than his years would suggest. His hands were rough and cracked. He picked at his fingers. He watched the piano man closely, and his legs shook restlessly. Looking forward to the show? I asked him tentatively. He gave me a sideways glance, and his legs stopped moving. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. He paused for a moment, and I thought perhaps that that was all he was going to say. I just hope he picks me. Really? I asked, trying to remain casually curious. What are you hoping to see? He gave me another sideways look, and I thought for a moment that I had overstepped. This was a personal thing, after all. But then he answered. My son. Oh, I said surprised. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, he said dismissively. He was so young when he... You know. And I wasn't much of a father then. I wasn't around like I was supposed to be. And then... When I was... He trailed off. You could tell how much it pained him to even speak on the topic. He reached up, his fingertips brushing gently against the torn brim of his hat. The hat I got at the first baseball game we went to. First and only. He finished with a sigh. He brought his hand back down to his lap. I just wanted to see what I was missing. Well, no matter the cost. I nodded. A brief pang of sadness resonating in my chest for the stranger. Well, it seems like the cost is only one tooth, so... That's not so bad, right? The man raised his eyebrows at me, and I immediately got the sense that I was missing something. The price is a bit steeper than night, pal. Before I could ask any more questions, there it was again. The bell tolled and all attention turned to the center of the room. The piano man finished his song with a flourish, quite literally jumped up from his bench. He surveyed the crowd with excitement, his tongue peeking out of his mouth and licking his lips as he swiveled his head around. And again, I thought for a moment that he had caught my eye, and I fought to look away. Then he raised his arm and pointed. The man next to me, whose name I had never caught, got up from his stool and made his way to the center of the piano bar. Hello, sir, the piano man said with a disarming relish. Thank you so much for volunteering. The man hadn't made a sound or gesture, as far as I could tell. But somehow, the piano man could tell that he wanted to be chosen. The man didn't say anything. The piano man stepped back around to his piano, 
sat at his bench and began to play. I couldn't see the memory that the Piano Man song played, but I could certainly feel it. It was like a deep, aching nostalgia deep in my stomach for something I'd never experienced. Not just never experienced, something that I desperately yearned for. I felt that pure sensation of want so terribly it made my eyes water. And then... It was over. It was the shortest song yet. I looked to the man. He was still standing straight, but his hands were clenched into fists at his side. His hat was low over his eyes. But there were tears rolling down his cheeks, and though he tried to contain it, a great cough of a sob came from his throat. Strangled and sad. The piano man gave him a moment, then he stood, grinning ear to ear. He put a hand on the man's shoulder. Time for your payment. The man hesitated, but only for a moment. Then his jaw fell open. He let the piano man reach inside. He didn't stick his hand in far, and in fact only grabbed hold of one of the men's front teeth. Then he began to pull. The man let out a long groan as they struggled, and then... Crack! The piano man held the tooth aloft an expression of sheer delight in his face. The man looked at it, his face stony, and then, just as he had the night before, the piano man tossed the tooth high in the air, threw his head back, and caught it in his mouth. He swallowed it. Then he brought his finger to his mouth. The whistle was so loud and shrill, the members of the audience had to cover their ears. A trickle of blood ran down from my eardrums to my neck as I uncovered them. But I could still hear it when, snap! The piano man smiled. A full, complete smile. His teeth, if I could truly call them his teeth, shone like jewels in the light of the piano bar. Then he opened his jaw wide. Then he opened it wider. And wider and wider. The man who had given him his final tooth hadn't stepped back to join the crowd. Instead, he stood, his head down, his shoulders tense. The piano man wiped his mouth and adjusted his velvet green suit. He bent down, he picked up the blue baseball cap that had landed on the floor of the piano bar. He glanced back to his instrument and placed the hat on the gleaming surface of his piano right next to the large, square, wire-framed glasses. Then he smiled. A toothless gummy grin. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast episode. And also wanted to let you know that if you're interested in getting some Dungeons & Dragons Creepypasta or many, many other things themed tea, you can always check out my wife's tea shop at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon. Because, quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights out of my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krause, G. Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hal Gungshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk. Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams. <laughs>